Are we good now? That's a yes? All oh, right, great. Okay, and okay. This, this sound is also working, David? Okay, great. thank you. All right, so without further ado, Brian, welcome thank back. You. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, Leanne. Uh, by the way, Sadie is back there in the booth. Sadie, come out and say hello because she has been critically important to, to doing this class. Really super helpful. This is, of course, like everything, a collective effort. And without any part of the collective, we can't do it. So um, just thank you to her and to the entire TPF staff, the People's Forum staff. A unique space uh, in New York, and I'd say pretty much anywhere in the United States, uh, having these kind of activities. Uh, I want to... This is the last class where there's going to be an actual presentation. Next class, the next session will be, as Leanne said, purely for Q&A. And uh, David, I wonder if I could go up a little bit louder, just a touch. Testing. All right. Is that better? Yeah. OK, good. Um, next week will be a purely Q&A, so people will have a chance to uh, ask anything that you want to ask. If, you do, if you're hearing things that seem unfamiliar, uh, names that you're not familiar with, issues or terms that you're not familiar with, write them down and we'll talk about them next week. Uh, a big reason for having a class like this is it's, ve is it's very difficult for people in the United States in particular, 100 years after Lenin's death, to actually be able to read and study Lenin and to understand the context of his teachings. And I've been emphasizing in the first two classes that context is everything for Lenin, everything. That you have to be in Lenin's head a little bit to understand what he's talking about because in each and every instance, he is fighting with somebody. He's in an argument. He's making a point, and if you don't know what the argument's about, and you don't know who he's fighting with, and you don't know the historical background, it's very hard, even for people who think that they're supporters of Lenin, to accurately understand what it is that Lenin is trying to say and do. And as a consequence, there's great misunderstanding, even by people who say, that they are Leninists or Marxist Leninists, whatever. So a big part of what we're trying to do here today is not go over everything about Lenin, but to provide background and context so that when you read Lenin or talk about Lenin, you have more familiarity with the sort of the backstory uh, in order to make it understandable. David, I think maybe down one notch on volume. I think it's just just a little bit. Go. I know it sounds very too nuanced, but um, I also was asked by somebody before the class, since we're talking about Lenin as the architect of revolution, first the Russian Revolution, and then as he helps form, and it's his vision to form a new international, the Communist International or the Third International, uh, somebody asked me, well, you're talking about revolution, but um, why do we need a revolution? Why revolution? Revolution is so, you know, like very rare in human history that there are revolutions. I mean, you can, you know, count them pretty quickly. There was the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, uh, of course, the uh, Bolivarian Revolution, where Latin America becomes independent from Spain and Portugal. There was then the 1848 revolution in Europe, the Paris Commune of 1871, the Mexican Revolution, which is a long and important revolutionary process uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. Then, of course, in the 20th century, revolutions start to happen more frequently. There's the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the Korean Revolution, the Vietnamese Revolution, the Cuban Revolution. But Generally speaking, in history, revolutions are pretty rare. And generally speaking also, people will do anything short of revolution to effectuate the change that they need 
in their lives, to make their lives better, to make their lives possible in many cases. People don't really want revolution. People want change. And the only reason revolutions happen is that the existing ruling class in a particular country at a particular time in history doesn't do what the people think it could do, has the power to do, has the authority to do, but fails to do because the ruling class is either dead set against the change or is so divided and paralyzed internally that it can't make the change. So frequently revolutions happen not because they are inevitable, but because the ruling classes have failed to make the change that people recognize is obvious and possible in a society. So revolutions could be avoided for some period of time if ruling classes did the right thing. But that's the issue. Ruling classes frequently don't do the right thing and in fact use all of their power, especially their power of, of repression. The army, the police, the courts, the prisons, the repressive apparatus, the state, in order to suppress those who want change. It's the inflexibility of the ruling class that makes revolution later inevitable. But it didn't necessarily have to be inevitable at that particular moment. For instance, in 1917, when the Tsar is finally overthrown, if the provisional government, the new government that took the place of the Tsar, which was made up of liberals, bourgeois liberals, petty bourgeois liberals, and some socialists, if that government had said, we're going to get out of World War I, we're going to end World War I, we're leaving, we're done fighting, the October Revolution that Lenin was the leader of would not have happened. Why did they not leave World War I when it was the issue, that the, the detonator that led to the overthrow of the Tsar in the February Revolution? Because the ruling class in Russia, the new liberal revolutionary uh, new government, was associated with British, French, and American imperialism, and they insisted that Russia stay in the war. Why did they want Russia to stay in World War I? Because if Russia stayed in the war, then Germany and the Central Powers, who were the adversaries of Britain, France, and the United States, if they stayed in the war, Germany would have to fight on the east and on the west. And if Russia ended the war, Germany could turn all of its attention to fight on the west against Britain and France. So Britain, France, and the United States, the imperialists, said to the provisional government, um, you have to stay in this thing. And because they were bourgeois, because they were not revolutionary people, because they wanted to accommodate bourgeois world public opinion, because they wanted to maintain those alliances, they stayed in the war. And by staying in the war over the next eight months, the Bolsheviks became the majority within the Soviets, the workers' councils, because they were the party that insisted that the war end. So it was a decision by the government not to do something it could do. I want to make this point because when we're talking about revolution, we're not doing it simply because it's interesting or Lenin is interesting. It's because we want to make change too. And a lot of people will think, well, why do you have to make a revolution? Why can't there be like a peaceful, non-revolutionary way to, make, to get the things society needs? And that's an excellent question. For instance, think about the, what we consider to be the antithesis of the Republican Party, the right-wing Trump-led Republican Party in the United States. The antithesis, according to conventional logic and conventional wisdom, is the Democratic Party. So let's think back. In 2008, in 2008, President Obama was elected President of the United States. The, how, the Democrats took over the House of Representatives by a big margin. They also had control of the Senate and almost a veto-proof number, almost 60 Democrats in the Senate. 
The Democrats could do whatever it was that they wanted to do, anything they wanted. Now, at that time, the big issue was 50 million people didn't have health care. And President Obama said, we're going to provide a new health care system, which became known as Obamacare. And he immediately, he immediately argued that, oh, that, full, that Medicare for all, a single-payer health plan, meaning universal national health plan, was off the table. Why did he do that? They had control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. They were very popular. 77% of the American people wanted single-payer health care, Medicare for all. That meant that everybody could go to a doctor when they're sick, that you weren't going to go bankrupt if you had to go to the doctor, and we all have to go to a doctor eventually. Why did he take it off the table when he could have had it? He took it off the table because Obama and the Democratic Party are wedded to the pharmaceutical companies, they're wedded to the private insurance companies, the capitalists who make healthcare equipment, the hospitals that are run for private purposes, meaning private profit. He took it off the table, not because it couldn't be done, but because he wouldn't do it because his administration was connected to, loyal to, and the servant of the big capitalist uh, for, uh, enterprises in the healthcare industry. In the last three years, 5.4 million families have been cut off from heat and electricity uh, by the utility companies. While those same utility companies have given billions of dollars to investors in profits because the utility companies are run for profit, did those families have to lose heat and light? No, it was a choice. It was a decision. And what motivated this, the, the decision by the utility companies and the governments that oversee them? The same thing that motivated Obama to say single-payer health plan is off the table. That they are in it for profit. Ultimately, the capitalist governments do things or are unwilling to do things, to put it more precisely, that could be achieved to remedy deep social problems, deep political problems, but they won't do it because they're tied to the capitalist system. Does that mean mass movements don't make a difference short of revolution? No, they do. I want to read something to you all from right now. Here it is. Today, New York Times, last two hours. President Biden warned Israel's leaders on Tuesday that they were losing international support for their war in Gaza, exposing a widening rift between Biden and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Mr. Biden delivered the blunt assessment of America's closest ally in the Middle East during a fundraiser in Washington where he described Mr. Netanyahu as the leader of the most conservative government and the most conservative government in Israel's history. And quote, he doesn't want a two-state solution, Biden said. Right now, and Biden did, then went on to denounce Israel's indiscriminate bombing of civilians. Well, that didn't start yesterday. This has been going on for two whole months. Why did Biden change his tune? What's changed? The mass movement of people in the United States day in and day out has changed the political climate in the United States so that President Biden's current policy of a complete embrace of Israeli genocide is not sustainable. He will lose the election. He is now backing up. Last night here at TPF, there were 400 volunteers at the meeting uh, in support of the Palestinian people. 400. The movement is getting stronger. So my point is, mass movements make a difference short of revolution. But at a certain point, the ruling class makes concessions only so far, and after the mass movement dies down, they try to take those concessions back. What happened to Roe v. Wade? and women's right to control their own bodies. It wasn't because the Supreme Court changed that much. It's because there was a diminution, a de-escalation of the mass women's uh, movement, the women's liberation movement that brought abortion rights in the first place back in 1972. It's really about the mass movement. Revolutions happen because society at a certain moment reaches a juncture 
whereby the ruling class has to make a choice. And if they don't do that which society needs and that which society knows the ruling class can actually do, that is what triggers revolutionary processes. So that's why we study revolution. Not because we love violence, not because we support armed struggle as against the peaceful road to socialism. It's because these are almost lawful events in the course of human history and that as people who want change, if you take revolution off the table, that means ultimately you've decided not to make far-reaching, radical, and completely achievable change in society. And none of us, at least those of us who are organizing this class, and certainly those of us who are in the PSL, none of us believe in that. We want real change. We want to end the war machine. We want to end a situation where a few billionaires control so much and more than half the country has food insecurity, where people are $500 away from being cast into utter bankruptcy, where one half of all bankruptcies in the country are because people can't pay their doctor's bills. If that's the reality, revolution will come not because we want it, but because the ruling class makes other forms of change almost impossible. Anyway, since my friend asked me the question, why are you so focused on revolution, I wanted to just open with that. Why was Lenin focused on the armed struggle and revolution? Because the revolution that they were, make, that they were planning, and I, and I started this in the first class and emphasized it again in the second class, Unlike the German socialists and the other socialists of the, of the Second International, the Socialist International, there was no option in Russia other than armed struggle because there was no free speech rights. There were no elections. It wasn't legal to be in a union. If you tried to organize against the Tsar, you faced Siberia exile or execution. When a government makes peaceful change impossible, it makes armed struggle inevitable. And all sectors in Russia, not just the Bolsheviks, also the Mensheviks, the social revolutionaries, even the bourgeois liberal cadets, everybody realized that this Romanov dynasty was going to be toppled only by force because for 300 years they had ruled by force. That's why Lenin's fusion of a sort of an armed struggle orientation, what was called Narodnism, combined with social democracy or socialism. That's what set the Bolsheviks apart from the German socialists and the other main parties of the Second International. They were involved in and planning for armed struggle because they had no choice. There were no other options. You either won or you died. It was that simple. There was no room anywhere else. Now, I want to raise a couple of the slides if we can. I want to just before I get started in the last phase where we're going to talk about the Third International and Lenin, what Lenin tries to do and the Bolsheviks try to do after the Russian Revolution succeeds. I want to just remind people so we don't forget. We're, we called Lenin and Lenin's leadership the fourth wave, the fourth wave of socialism. So let's go to the slide with the utopian socialists. I can't remember the number. There they are, Robert Owens, Henri Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier. These were utopian socialists, and I hope people remember why they were, why Marx and Engels called them utopian. It's because they believed they could set up cities and towns that were based on communist principles and that the ruling class of society would see that by giving employment for everyone, having food for everyone, equal wages for everyone, women's rights, the end of jails and prisons, that the ruling class in society would see this is a better way to live. And Marx and Engels said that's utopian, not because they're, what they were trying to achieve was utopian, but the idea that the ruling class would go along with it. The ruling class will not give up its power and its privilege because they've been won over to a better idea. So that's why they're utopians. That's wave one. Wave two was Marx and Engels. Slide two, Marx and Engels. There they are. They wrote the Communist Manifesto at age 27 and 28. 
young revolutionaries. Um, it's always young people. You never see pictures of them except when they're old and have these gigantic beards. But they were younger at one time and had less facial hair. Uh, that, they wrote the Communist Manifesto on the eve of the 1848 revolution. Uh, it outlined the prospects for revolution. Brilliant work. Everyone should read it, especially the first two chapters in the preface. The rest of it is not really relevant anymore except for historical interest. The first two chapters, if you read them, you'll think, oh, that could have been written today. So the Communist Manifesto, very short. They talked about the party. Remember I said last week they were always talking about the party, the party, but they didn't have a party. What they meant is the people who agreed with them, and they were very few in number. They formed the first international, uh, which was not Marxist. Marx was the organizer of it. He was such a brilliant, he's not just a brilliant political scientist and a brilliant historian, and really was the one who discovered and outlined the laws of capitalism. He was also a brilliant activist. Marx and Engels were activists. Marx organized the First International in 1864 after having organized British textile workers to support the North in the US Civil War. He wanted to have the British workers stand up and support the North in the Civil War because the textile industry in England was dependent on, on cotton picked in the South. And so British textile firms were going out of business. The bosses said we should support the South because without the South, south the Southern co uh, cotton, which was boycotted by American ships, uh, our factory is going to go out of business. You're going to be unemployed. You won't be able to f uh, feed your kids. Marx and Engels raced into that struggle. They helped organize the British labor movement to to say, even though they were going to be harmed by the boycott of Southern Cotton, to stand with the North, because to, to stand with the North meant to stand against the enslavement of human beings. So Marx was an activist. He was an organizer, not just a thinker and writer. In 1864, he brings this whole group of, um, you know, labor people from all, from all countries in Europe together in the First International, and none of them are Marxists. Matter of fact, most of them are anarchists, bourgeois liberals, or reformists. But Marx organizes them and keeps them in. He organizes it and unites them. He doesn't demand that they all think his thoughts. He's not some purist sectarian at all. Why? Because the goal of the First International was not to make revolution. The goal of the First International was to unite all of these disparate sections of a newly forming urban proletariat in European countries because every time the French workers went on strike, the French bosses brought in German scabs. When the, when the British workers went on strike, they'd bring in French scabs. So then the workers would hate the French scabs instead of their British bosses, the old trick of divide and conquer. So Marx and Engels organized the first international that was not Marxist and not based on parties. They had a part, they called it a party, no party. The international, not Marxist. That's wave two. Wave three is the second international for which there are no slides. But it was the formation uh, 15 years later of mass socialist parties in Europe, especially most noteworthy, the one you're going to want to remember in your study is the German Socialist Party. Because they became the party once the German workers won the vote that by 1910, they were the biggest party in Germany. They were a Marxist party. They were the biggest party in Germany. Germany had the first women's rights, biggest women's rights movement. It had the first gay rights movement. The country was very progressive. It was, had socialists dominating the parliament. Uh, they were the third wave. Lenin, in his, the beginning of the formation of the Bolsheviks, is looking to the German party. Do you have a slide of Karl Kautsky? That's the czar. That's not Kautsky. Those are words. <laughs> We're getting there. Okay, Karl Kautsky, who Lenin later writes these books. You would think uh, Lenin really hated Kautsky. He wrote The Proletarian Revolution and the Renegade Kautsky. Uh, and most people who are Leninists think, ah, Kautsky was a terrible 
counter-revolutionary liberal. Lenin, in fact, admired the German Socialist Party. Kautsky was the theoretical leader of it. He only breaks with the German Socialist Party when, at the time of the beginning of World War I, where the parliamentary domination that they have at the Reichstag means nothing because they vote for the war, right? So this is when I sort of was laying out that this is when Bolshevism really, and I would say Bolshevism becomes Leninism as an international current because now Lenin is rejecting the second international parties. Why? Because they sold out at the beginning of the war because they voted for war credits after they had pledged, all the socialist parties had pledged not to vote for war credits, to oppose the war should it come, to take advantage of the war should it come, to make revolution. Instead, they, they became patriots. And frankly, I think a lot of people on the US left would be very patriotic too if, um, say, Russia soldiers were invading the United States, right? It's pretty hard to be anti-war when your soldiers are killing each other. I mean, big parts of the United States liberal movement have a hard time opposing their government when it comes to their government just bombing the hell out of other people. When there's no Americans dying, when we had demonstrations for Libya against the war on Libya in 2011, most liberals uh, didn't join us in the protest. They said, oh, Gaddafi's evil, Gaddafi's terrible. Well, just think if Gaddafi was actually sending Libyan troops to fight against American uh, soldiers or American civilians, very hard to take an anti-war position. But Lenin said the, the war, World War I, will create the condition for revolution. You have to stay strong at the beginning of the war because if you don't, if you capitulate, if you surrender, not only does the party become imbued with national chauvinism against the other workers of other countries, in the case of West Europe, it, they became more chauvinistic towards the people in the colonies because all of those European countries had colonies and the war was over what capitalist power in Europe was going to control different parts of Africa and Asia and Latin America and the Middle East. So Lenin breaks from the socialist international and creates the fourth wave, the fourth wave of socialism. Here's World War I. When the war started, most of the uh, belligerent armies thought the war would be over in a couple months. It went on for four years. 20 million people died. I mean, just think of what, just think of how terrible it is in Gaza, what we're seeing. That's like 20,000 have been killed in two months. 50, 70, 100,000 were be being killed each day in World War I, in many of the battles. It was that bad. And that's when poison gas was used against the people in trenches. The trenches didn't move. And finally, in Russia, the Bolsheviks win the allegiance of the masses who remember that the Bolsheviks had told them from the beginning, We're, this war is a rich man's war. It's a bourgeois war. Let's not fight it. Let's stand in solidarity and retain our principles. And the Bolsheviks had been scattered, exiled, their leaders in the parliament were threatened with the death penalty. All right. So I'm just catching up. So are we all caught up? All right. It's kind of important to do the catching up because it's very, especially because the class isn't day by day. It's a week's time and so much happens within a week. If we don't kind of remember what we've covered, it's very hard to really appreciate the new material. But I do want to move into the new material. There's two elements here that I want us to appreciate about Lenin. One is Lenin's capacity, Lenin's capacity to be bold and audacious and to see beyond what others were seeing in terms of the revolutionary possibilities. And at the same time, Lenin was extremely honest and practical so that if the party and the movement could not go forward, if it had to retreat, he demanded that the party retreat. This is really important because a lot of people think 
And a lot of people online on social media who start to read Lenin think, I like Lenin because he's bold and audacious. He made revolution. But Lenin also carried the movement, the party, the class through not only retreats, but actual surrenders. The question wasn't only about the need to surrender, but how to surrender. And I want to talk about how these two elements of Lenin's political persona, his political personality, his orientation, again, seeped in Marxism, studied everything from Marxism, a very revolutionary force, ready to go, ready to make revolution, ready to die for the revolution, ready to go to prison, but also recognizing that when a retreat was necessary, that they would undertake it. When Lenin comes back in February 19, um, April 1917, the re as, I, as you might remember, the revolution is in full swing. The czar is gone. The masses are celebrating. I mentioned that everybody was trying to get their hands on every available wine bottle. They were breaking up the wineries, wine cellars. They were, it was just a time of great celebration. A 300-year monarchy was done. And everybody was euphoric about the new government, including many of the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks said, yes, it's a bourgeois government, many of the Bolsheviks, it's a bourgeois government, but it's a revolutionary government and people are so angry and everything is so political and the masses of people are so in the streets taking over the factories that the government will be compelled to do our bidding. We just have to pressure the government. We have to make it do the right thing. So Lenin arrives back in St. Petersburg in April 1917 and he meets a group of Bolsheviks and then he meets with a group of Bolsheviks and Mensheviks and he gives a speech and the speech is called the April Thesis. Uh, we didn't print it out. We didn't send it out. People should find it. Take a note. The April Thesis. Uh, read it. It's so short. You can read it in five minutes. But what he basically says is the revolution that started in February, the bourgeois democratic revolution against Tsarism, that phase has ended and now we're going to have a second phase and we're going to overthrow the provisional government, the revolutionary government, and replace it with a government of poor, poor peasants and workers. And it's going to be what he called the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. Now, dictatorship, by the way, dictatorship has kind of got a bad name these days. When, when Marx and Lenin are using the term dictatorship, they don't mean it the way it's understood in contemporary language. Dictatorship means today totalitarian regimes where there's no free expression, no elections, no democracy. That's not what they mean by the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat is within a Marxist framework, the replacement of the dictatorship of the rich with the dictatorship of the working class, meaning the new society will be based on the supremacy of the oppressed and exploited class rather than the oppressor and exploiting class. So just subs when you hear the terms dictatorship of the proletariat, it sounds like, it, like an embrace of evil because we think of dictatorship as evil. What they mean is the supremacy of the proletariat, the working class, and the poor people in the, in the countryside, that they are going to be the supreme power in society. So the dictatorship means the army, the police, the courts, the prisons are going to sustain a life where there's basically a guarantee of democracy for the majority and that forbids or prevents the exploitation of people by other people. So it's not the emotive, the emotion, emotive context for dictatorship is completely missing. The czar was a dictator by contemporary standards. They never called the czar the dictator. Dictatorship is used in a different uh, context, both in the 19th and the early part of the 20th century. It's only later with the rise of fascism that dictatorship really uh, assumes the contemporary meaning that we're all familiar with. 
So Lenin comes back and says, there's going to be a second revolution and there's going to be a second revolution because the, this new government won't get out of the war and the masses need to get out of the war. The war has to end. We've lost 3 million people in Russia, all poor people. The rich are not doing the fighting. It's poor people doing the fighting. And they don't want to, and their families can't eat. The, the soldiers are mainly illiterate peasants. They want to go home and try to feed their families by, you know, planting and harvesting. So Lenin has the April thesis where he's, he comes back and everybody is like, what? We just had a revolution that overtop, overthrew a 300-year monarchy, and it was a month ago, and now we're going to have a second revolution? And Lenin's, Lenin's argument is yes. And he identifies the logic of the situation, the imperative logic for the second revolution based on his assessment that the government won't get out of the imperialist war. And unless they do that, they can't remedy the other social problems. And another class will study 1917 because February, April is a, a, February is a period, March, April, each month represents a different shift and change inside of Russia in that dramatic revolutionary year. At the beginning, the liberals have the upper hand. The Bolsheviks are a tiny minority. When, when Lenin arrives, he's considered like, basically a madman. They basically think the guy's been out of town too long. He's living in Europe. He doesn't know what's going on. He's not in touch with us. He's an outsider. And let's face it, he's an extremist. <clears throat> Eight months later, he's the head of state. The Bolsheviks go from being a tiny minority to being the dominant part of the Soviet. When Lenin first comes back, he says, we're going to have a second revolution, but we're not going to make the call, the slogan, be for revolution. This is very important about Lenin's tactics. The April thesis does not insist that the, that the Bolsheviks call for revolution. In fact, he says, don't call for revolution. Instead, and the reason is, the masses of people won't be able to hear us. Why won't they be able to hear us? Because they're loyal to the new government that replaced the Tsar. Lenin said, the logic of the situation will reveal itself. We have to remain consistent and we have to, and this is his expression, <clears throat> one that you can remember, patiently and persistently explaining to the masses of people what the real situation is. So what's the role of the Vanguard Party? In April 1917, Lenin says, patiently and persistently explain. Why? He said, because we don't make revolution. The party doesn't make the revolution. The people make the revolution. And the people right now don't believe in revolution. The people right now believe in the new government. <coughs> but over time, over the next few months, that's going to change. And if we patiently and persistently explain to them what the situation is, by sometime, he didn't know when, the tide would turn. And so that's precisely what happens. By September, the Soviet has gotten, is no longer infatuated with the liberals. They have lost, they become cynical about the provisional government. And Lenin, who's in exile, because if the provisional government cap captures him, they will kill him. Because they know without Lenin, the Bolsheviks, as strong as they are, won't succeed. He's the one holding the party together. It's his leadership. There, is, there, are, there are rare moments in history, very rare, when the role of an individual is the decisive factor. Or a decisive factor, not the, but a decisive factor. If Lenin had been killed in April, or May, or June, or July, or August, or September... The October Revolution would not have happened. Lenin built the party, constructed the party, had the loyalty of the party. The party had many different political trends and tendencies, a lot of personalities fighting each other. He was the glue that held it together, and he also tactically, as a tactical genius, as a tactical genius who combined political insight and analysis with a tactical brilliance that was unmatched. 
He knew how to go forward at every different stage of the revolution. And in September, in exile in Finland, he's like, you, the Central Committee, have to launch the revolution right now. Because if we let this moment pass where all the conditions are ripe for revolution, the bourgeoisie is paralyzed, they don't know what to do, we've gotten the upper hand, the majority of people are with us, the time will go. You can't make revolution anytime. It's only at a very particular moment. Strike while the iron is hot. And so all of his letters, you know, all of the letters, can the Bolsheviks retain state power, the coming catastrophe and how to prevent it. You can look through all of those writings of 1917 there the urgency of lenin is like we got to do this right now he lays out even like how to fight and most of his ideas are rejected because they weren't actually that good uh other comrades knew better about how to use firearms and you know lenin wasn't really a you know like a, a military force so the central committee is won over by lenin's persistence his urgency and other comrades in the leadership actually staged the insurrection. And the insurrection is bloodless. I think six people died. The whole government just collapses in St. Petersburg. Then in Moscow, St. Petersburg was then the capital. In Moscow, the right wing tries to fight back and they try to overturn the bloodless revolution of October 25th in St. Petersburg, and there's a week of fighting before the right wing loses. Hundreds of people died, but that was about it. It wasn't thousands or hundreds of thousands. If the right wing and the imperialists had left the Russian Revolution alone, it would have been largely a bloodless affair, but that's not what happened. So it's the audacity of Lenin to say comes back in April, the April thesis, this audacity, this knowledge, this tactical sagacity, wisdom. All right, what happens right after the revolution? They're all filled with optimism. Workers all over the world are like, the Bolsheviks did it the first time in history that the, the poor people took over. It's a revolution of the poor, the poor peasants, the workers. And they say right away, decree on land. The decree on land is all the, all the peasants take the land. The landed estates, they're yours now. And all the peasants like, who've never read Karl Marx are thinking, this is a good revolution. I like the Bolsheviks. The, the decree on peace, the war is over. They announce, we've, we're demobilizing the army. We're not fighting anymore. All the soldiers are sent home. They were like, great. So even though the Bolsheviks were still a tiny part of the population, if, you, if we have the map of Russia, the old Russian Empire map, you can see that, you can see what a monumental achievement was. I mean, look at how big this is. It goes all the way to Poland, and the rest of the map's not there, but it goes all the way to the Pacific. But look at where, let me not disconnect here. Look at where, you have just a few cities, Moscow, St. Petersburg, which is the capital, a couple big cities, a couple smaller cities, the whole rest of this vast area, the largest landmass of any country in the world, it's, it's peasants. And they don't know how to read or write. They're illiterate. 90% or more of the peasantry is completely illiterate because of the holding back of society by the Tsar. But the Bolsheviks having seized power in St. Petersburg and Moscow start issuing the decrees, the decree on land, the decree on peace. They also issue a decree announcing that they are for the self-determination of the non-Russian nationalities that have been oppressed by the Tsar. Who are those nationalities? Look at this. Poland is part of Russia. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, part of Russia. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. This is the Caucasus. The Ukraine, part of the Russian Empire. Belarus. And then down in the south, there's 
Do we have another map? Okay, well, this is a Soviet map, which weirdly, the countries are not identified, but numerically listed based on an alphabetical order. So Russia is 11. That's one, that one's easy. But when you get into these smaller areas, but these are, this is, the, this is called the Baltics. This is Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Hope I'm going to succeed here. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Did I say Kazakhstan? Okay. So there, the, there you have it. These are, these are all non Russian nationalities except number 11. And even in number 11, huge numbers of people are not Russians. There's like 100 plus languages spoken in this, in this empire. The Tsar and the Tsarist bureaucracy just kept conquering nations and incorporating them. Lenin called the Russian Empire the prison house of nations. And Lenin argued that all of the non-Russian nations should have the right of self-determination. And what does self-determination mean? Uh, Woodrow Wilson also had a position about self-determination, the 14 points, uh, which is a fraud. But he's competing with Lenin and competing with the communists who say we're for self-determination. Lenin said, if you're, a not, if you're a nation and you're not Russian and you're part of the old Russian empire, you should have the right of self-determination, which means the right to secede. It's a very simple definition of what self-determination means. Secede, what does that mean? It means you have the right to be independent. You have the right to divorce from Russia. But Lenin also argued that just because you have the right to divorce doesn't mean you should get divorced. He's making the argument that the unity of the socialist government in Russia with the non-Russian nationalities had to be based on a different formula than that of the Tsar. The Tsar wasn't a, a relationship of conquest, of domination, of inequality. And Lenin said, if, if we're going to really be uh, you know, comrades, you, the non-Russians, have to voluntarily agree to be in a relationship with socialist Russia. Not because we compel you, not because we're bigger, not because our army's stronger, but because you want it. And why do you want it? Because the majority of your population are also workers and peasants. And if we, Russia, are creating a socialist government, why would the Poles, for instance, want to be independent and away from Russia and be under the leadership of Polish landlords? and the landed aristocracy. Why wouldn't the Polish working class prefer to be with their comrade workers in a socialist federation or a union of Soviet socialist republics, which is what eventually is created by Lenin in 1922, shortly before he dies. And the whole concept is that this new relationship between big nations, powerful nations, and former imperial nations and the oppressed nations changes based on the right of self-determination. So Leninism and Bolshevism enshrine, embolden the idea of self-determination, which is nothing other than a democratic right to get divorced. So that if Poland wants to be independent, they can. And then Lenin's basic argument was, okay, let's say Poland becomes independent, but it's led by communists. Who cares whether they are formally and technically part of, the, of Russia? Because we're all comrades. We don't, we're not going to, we're going to, we have the basis for unity. So this is the land, the decree on land makes the peasants want to be with the Bolsheviks. The decree on peace makes the, Bolshev makes the Bolsheviks very popular with all the soldiers. And the decree on nationalities makes the Bolsheviks very popular with the non-Russian nationalities. Then what happens? Now it's December. They've just issued the decree of peace. 
They said, we're done fighting, no indemnifications, no annexations. We don't want anything from anybody. Nobody can take anything from us. We're done fighting. The Germ they enter in the central powers, that's Germany and the Ottoman Empire in particular, and the, and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg dynasty. They accept the Rush Lenin's decree on peace. They said, good, let's have peace. Because that means they don't have to fight on the Eastern Front. They can fight Britain and France. Britain and France and the United States denounce the decree on peace. And then there's an armistice signed in December 1917. Now the Russian, the Lenin and the Bolsheviks are still pretty optimistic. They've had a bloodless revolution. And what happens next is the Germans meet with them and say, yeah, let's have an armistice agreement. Let's meet in, this, in the town of Brest-Litovsk in, in what's now Belarus, just north of Ukraine, and we'll have a peace deal. And the Germans outline what the peace deal is. And the deal is, you give us Ukraine. You give us Poland. You give us all of these territories. And if you don't, we're going to start a war against you, and you no longer have an army because you, Lenin, demobilized the army. And this creates a major split in the Bolsheviks. And the reason I want, to, I'm, I want to remind you where I'm going with this. April 1917, the audacity of Lenin to see the possibility for an offensive, for revolution. Now confronted with the German imperialists at a time when the Russian army is gone, demobilized. Lenin says, we have to sign the treaty. And the other comrades say, what? We just had a revolution and now we're going to give German imperialism, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. That's what the Germans were demanding. And Lenin says, yes, we're going to sign the treaty because if we don't sign the treaty, we're going to face a German offensive and we don't have an army and we're going to lose everything. Is it humiliating? Yes. Is it terrible? Yes. Should we sign it? Yes. Why? Because we don't have a choice. So remember I said Lenin also had the capacity to surrender. It was a question of how to surrender. There are moments when you have to surrender. And he's demanding from the Bolsheviks that they surrender to German imperialism because they can't fight. And if they try to fight in a, quote, revolutionary war, they're going to be defeated and lose everything. And it splits the party apart. And Lenin is a tiny minority. Lenin, Lenin has almost no support. And the, and the Bolsheviks refuse to sign the treaty. And Trotsky is sent. And Trotsky's, Trotsky had a centrist position in this. There was the, the left wing led by Bukharin and others who said, we have to start a revolutionary war against Germany. And Lenin said, you're just issuing revolutionary phrases. How do you start a revolutionary war without, a revolution, without an army? And then Trotsky took this kind of rhetorical position. He, he went to Brest-Litovsk and he said, we're done fighting, but we're not going to sign the peace deal. Goodbye. Thank you. And the Germans are like, what? What just happened? Like the most unusual diplomatic encounter. And Trotsky's line was, the German revolution is about to happen. The German workers, just like the Russian workers, are so fed up with this war, if we sort of stall the negotiations and show that we're not belligerents, we, don't lo we no longer will fight Germany, it will incentivize the German revolution, and then we'll have two socialist countries, and one of them will be a modern industrial powerhouse, Germany. So the negotiations stretch out for almost seven weeks, and then the Germans say, to hell with you, we're done with all of this talk. They launch the offensive. They sweep over all of these territories. Within three days, they're 100 miles from St. Petersburg. Lenin and the Bolsheviks have to vacate the capital because it's about to be overrun. Because the Bolsheviks procrastinated in signing a deal that was so loathsome, so awful, so humiliating, and they were so filled with revolutionary pride and anger and urgency. And Lenin couldn't win the argument. And he was Lenin. But he could not convince his comrades. It took the German military to sweep and take almost everything. Then everybody said, oh, yeah, let's sign the treaty. 
Here were the terms of the treaty now. The treaty, the terms got much worse because they had procrastinated. Under the treaty's new terms, Russia lost complete control of Ukraine, Poland, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, parts of the Caucasus, and significant areas in southern Russia. The territory of the Russian government lost under the new terms. Get these numbers. I know it's hard to hear the, stat, the stats, but just, this is short. The territory the Russian government lost under the new terms, the harsher terms of brest included one-third of the entire population. One-third of the people were now going to be under the control of German capitalists and landlords. One-third. More than 50% of the factories in Russia were now given to Germany under the new terms. 50%. 89% of Russia's coal fields were surrendered to Germany under the new terms. And 26% of the railways. And the Bolsheviks signed the agreement that they would pay reparations to Germany for having fought them in the first place. And Lenin was like, this is the right thing to do. So the that started the civil war in Russia. The socialist revolutionaries, the left-wing partners of the Bolsheviks, they then staged an armed uprising against the Bolsheviks. They began the armed struggle. It was leftists. It wasn't right-wingers. Right-wingers also started the armed struggle at the same time. ex officers, Rangel, Danikin, and others. And as I mentioned last time, 14 imperialist armies invaded, 14 imperialist armies invaded and supported all of these armed uprisings against the Bolsheviks. So for the next three years, 1918, 1919, and about half of 1920, two and a half years, every comrade went to the front. If you were like left-wing people, like the people in this room, you would be the first to go to the front. By 1920, 90% of the people were dead who had gone to the front. All the communists who made the revolution, who led the revolution, who were the stalwart supporters of the Bolsheviks, they died. Other parts of the country were so devastated that one to two million people starved to death because they could not get food and water. Cannibalism reappeared in the Russian countryside. And during this entire time, Lenin was insistent that this was the right thing, and he was obviously correct. He was obviously correct, because if they had not signed the treaty, they would have been destroyed right then. By the end of the Civil War, somehow they prevailed. 14 imperialist armies are defeated or, or, or withdraw. The right-wing office, uh, czarist officers, they're, dis, they're defeated. A lot of the territory that was lost, when the German Revolution happens in November 1918, the, Lenin immediately announces, well, the brest Treaty is no longer, uh, is no longer relevant. The Red Army moves in, back into Ukraine. The Red Army moves into Georgia, moves into Belarus, moves into the Balkans. There's a socialist revolution in Finland, which the Germans had also taken. So Finland becomes the second socialist government. So this battle, this epic battle that went on for three years, and during that entire time, Lenin, having agreed to the humiliating treaty, is now involved in the militant defense and using every available tactic to defeat the counter-revolution. Wow, I mean, that's a lot to handle, right? You have a famine, you have invasion of 14 armies, you have counter-revolution. I mean, just think what they were dealing with. And he's now, by this time, by, the, by 19... 20, he's about to, he turns 50 in April. He was 46 at the time of the revolution. He dies two years later. You know, the exhaustion, the strain, the stress, 
the entire process, uh, you know, where Lenin basically lived in the the servant headquart the servant quarters in the in the old Kremlin and and never left essentially, just worked and worked and worked, managing all of that. And during the middle, and I'm going to end on this point, in the middle of the civil war, and in the middle of famine that took one to two million lives, Lenin says, we have to build a new socialist international. This is another task of the Bolsheviks. So we have three tasks. One task is to defend the country against counter-revolution. That took three million lives. To bring food to the starving masses. There were one to two million had starved to death. But now let's reorganize the socialist movement. I mean, just think of the, the magnitude of the task that you're going to use the headquarters in Moscow to reorganize the socialist movement based on new principles, based on new principles. And so that's what happens. So these are the three big tasks of the, uh, of the Russian project, basically, at that time. I want to go to us. I, I, what time is it? I've been going for about an hour, which is... I apologize for the length, but there was a lot of ground to cover. I want to I want to do four quick slides and then open it up for Q and A. Go to slide number two, and I'll try to do this in five minutes. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Slide the second point of the terms of conditions. Okay, so the common turn is organized on a new basis. Again, remember I said last week that abroad the Bolsheviks were very popular because they had succeeded in the Russian Revolution. So everybody was like, yeah, let's join the revolution. Let's be with the new international. The Socialist International had officially collapsed in 1916. So the, the door was open. But Lenin said, having learned the lesson of what it took, why did the Second International collapse? It was because of the capitulation on World War I because of the domination of a party of a whole class. Remember we talked about that where the center and the right were dominating over the right at a time of great crisis. So there's 21 conditions to join the new international. And this splits the socialist movement in half. But Lenin is insisting that these are some of the principal conditions. Um, any organization that wishes to join the communist international must consistently and systematically dismiss reformists and centrists from positions of any responsibility in the working class movement. Parliamentary groups, the unions, etc. Okay, so the people who were capitulating on the war, they can't be in the party unless they self-criticize themselves. Let's go to slide number four. Persistent and systematic propaganda and agitation must be conducted in the armed forces. Now, this is important. During the Vietnam War, there was a very big part of the anti-war movement was among US GIs because leftists and progressives went into the army, went into the Navy, went into the Marines, and organized against the imperialist war from within the military. Some parts of the left say, oh, the military, they're all war criminals. Lenin says, no, the, work, the, the, the rank and file soldier is nothing other than a worker in uniform. And so you... Go to the class, organize the class, break the class away from the bourgeoisie. In the case of the armed forces, the officer corps is the bourgeoisie in uniform. The soldier, the rank and file, is the worker in uniform. So not, point number four is you have to go inside the military and try to recruit the workers. This is critical because you can't really have a revolution against an imperialist army if it's united. The Russian Revolution, which we didn't talk, you know, the 19, year of 1917, the soldiers defected the side of the workers and peasants. The, sol the officers say, shoot those peasants. And the, uh, the, workers, the soldiers say, no, I'm not going to shoot them. They're my sisters. I'm not going to do it. They're my brothers. I'm not going to do it. And then the officer comes up and shoots the first soldier who was insubordinate. And then the other soldiers who have been listening to all of this socialist agitation turn and shoot the officer. And then the soldiers are now on the side of the revolution. That's how it happened. But this is a period of preparation within the military to show the class nature that the, that the imperialist military is a microcosm of class society. 
the rank and file soldier is a worker in uniform. Uh, next, next slide is point number eight. Okay, this is, this is the kind of the one I'm going to sort of end on. I wanted to do more, but I'll pick it up in the Q&A. Parties in countries whose bourgeoisie possess colonies and oppress other nations must pursue a well-defined and clear-cut policy in respect of colonies and oppressed nations. Any party wishing to join the Third International must ruthlessly expose the colonial machinations of the imperialists of its, quote, own country, must support, indeed, not merely in words, every colonial liberation movement, demand the expulsion of the compatriot imperialists, et cetera, et cetera. So makes the principle of anti-colonialism, anti-racism, anti-imperialism, and internationalism. And then the fourth slide, the last slide, which is number 15. It is the duty of any party wishing to join the Communist International selflessly to help any Soviet Republic in its struggle against counter-revolutionary forces. And then the Communist parties everywhere have to promote peace and good relations instead of war with the Socialist Republics. They're not talking here about just Russia. They were envisioning that the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics would keep expanding and include all of the countries of the world. So the Union was going to be the new world order, basically, not simply a, Ru a new Russian iteration of the Russian Empire, but with socialist or communist coloration. Uh, the, I didn't have time, because we've run out of time, to talk about the impact of the Third International. But as I said last time, the impact of the Russian Revolution, the position in support of armed struggle, the position of the right of nations to self-determination, uh, the support that the Soviets gave to colonized and semi-colonized people, that moves Marxism and socialism to the east and to the south. Socialism was a European phenomena until now. Now it becomes an African phenomena, an Asian phenomena, a Middle Eastern phenomena, a Latin American phenomena. Let's, I want to just bring up the slides of the, I mean, it went to China. And right away, the Chinese Communist Party was formed because the Third International was forming communist parties in China. Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnam, same. Kim Il-sung in North Korea. Uh, Madame Bin, the leader of the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. Uh, George Habash, the leader of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Marxist-Leninist. Fidel, obviously, Marxist-Leninist. Che, of course. Uh, Celia Sanchez, another major primary leader of the Cuban Revolution. Uh, same with Vilma Espin. Chris Hani, assassinated South African Communist Party member who was assassinated at the time of right around the time that apartheid was about to end or ending. And finally, Kwame Nkrumah, the leader of Ghana, not really from a communist party, but part of, if you read his book, Class Struggles in Africa, obviously part of the impact of the Third International. So socialism and communism and Marxism are, are no longer predominantly European. They're really merged. Originally, it was merging the socialist movement with the workers' movement. Now it's merging socialism with the movements of national liberation against imperialism. And that's really how, in a way, Lenin creates the fifth wave of socialism. The international creates the fifth wave, which is this phenomenon. Uh, again, I'll stop right there. Thank you, everybody. And there's still time for Q&A. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, for that riveting session and we're getting to our favorite part question and answer so I would like to if, if you're online if you can submit your questions into the chat and Saidi and David will send them to me if you're in the room could you raise your hands and we'll take a couple at a time I think a few. all right so let's start here let's do the two here and then we'll move to this side Firstly, thank you for this course. I wanted to ask, <clears throat> getting into the common turn, um, looking at two people from, well, within Harlem who went to the common turn, Otto von Hayeswood and, and Claude McKay, right? And I wanted to ask about the kind of multiplicity, you know, different struggles being represented there 
but under uh, a similar banner of the common turn. How do we see that kind of diversity play with that, um, that you know, role of uh, unity in the common turn? Yeah, similarly, thank you. Um, uh, I was actually wondering, so, you know, I think it's probably pretty probable that the United States is moving towards the conditions for violent revolution. When I think about kind of like the particular contingencies of our moment. Can you speak oh. up just a little? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Is that better? That's yeah. Great. So the particularly contingencies of like our contemporary moment seem to be kind of rapidly expanding technology. Um, and so I guess I'm kind of wondering what role do you think technology will play in kind of creating the conditions for revolution? And I think relatedly, um, do you think we're kind of in a particularly novel historical moment or is it kind of presentist, presentist bias to believe that our particular conditions are um, harder to overcome than they have been in the past? Should I go with those two? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, communists like Claude McKay and others from the United States, from New York City, uh, were pl uh, figures in the Third International. The Third International was amazing because it brought, in the, in the first five years, especially the Congresses, uh, they brought together all of these revolutionary forces who, you know, Moscow was in a way a safe space. Um, and people could come there, they could debate, they could discuss. And ultimately, the common turn, the common turn saw itself as a world party. This is something really important. The Socialist International, the Second International, was uh, an aggregate of different parties who had conferences together and they shared resolutions. The Common Turn had an executive committee. It was based on democratic centralism. And once a decision was taken, that decision applied to all the member groups, all the member parties within the International. So if you're a German party, a US party, French party, what the Common Turn as a part, as an entity decided, had a binding impact on your policy. So in the case of the CPUSA, the, the Comintern intervened frequently on a number of issues, not the Communist Party USA, communist, the attempt to form a Communist Party. One was on how, in, in the beginning of the process, it was mainly European immigrants who were not actually native English speakers who were the dominant force. So trying to, broaden the ranks of the party to other sectors. Secondly, the common turn felt that the, U that the U US party was downplaying the struggle uh, for black freedom and downplaying the struggle uh, for self-determination for black people in America. And actually, in the common turn decision in 1928, the common turn, and this was part of the debates that Claude McKay and others were involved in, the common turn made the decision that black people in the South, in the black belt, where black people constituted a majority of the population, constituted an oppressed nation within the United States, and as such, had the same right of self-determination to secede from the United States and create a black nation. And that this became the demand of the Communist Party in 1928. That was um, a very militant shift. And it also propelled the Communist Party, which was basically a northern party, to send cadres to the south, where they organized essentially what were armed struggle organizations because sharecroppers unions, which were essentially black-led, but they recruited some of the whites as well. Matter of fact, they recruited thousands of poor white people, uh, they could not exist except as armed struggle organizations because there was the dictatorship of the rich, very much so in the South, such that if you tried to protest or even just be, you would be killed. And this was largely the intervention of the common turn. When the common turn did that, that's when the case of the Scottsboro brothers and the other big uh, defense campaign started for black America with the CP. And the CP became the most important multi-racial organization in the United States. And again, it upheld Lenin's theory when you think about it, like by 
advocating the right of self-determination, it wasn't done to create separation, but to build unity. But the unity is based on equality. The equality means I have the right to get divorced. I have the right to leave you. If you, the racist United States, conduct yourself the way you've been conducting yourself, why should I stay with you? I can exercise my right of self-determination. We can create a black republic. And the, and the fact that the, a multiracial party was advocating that was very attractive to a significant sector of young black activists who joined the party. So it was a really interesting sort of reflection of how the right of self-determination isn't simply to separate, it's also to build unity, but to build unity on a principled basis of genuine equality. It's a unifier. Anyway, there was so much diversity in the international, and just think, you, had, you could go and learn from all these other comrades from around the world. And um, anyway, I'll leave it there. That was one long answer. In terms of technology and where we are, you never know where you are in the historical continuum until after the fact. And you know, I've made this point numerous times. When Rosa Parks gave up her, didn't give up her seat, in 1955, she had no idea that the next day that would trigger what became like the civil rights revolution. You don't know. You don't know when the thing that you do is the spark. Usually what we do is like knocking our heads against the wall and people get frustrated. They were like, the meeting's still, still, still too small. But Rosa Parks was in small meetings for years in the basement of churches. And then that one time it snapped. And when they called the boycott the next day, everybody adhered to it. And the leaders said, okay, let's call it off because one day is a success. We can't do it two days. And the masses said, no, let's go two days. And they ended up not taking a bus or public transportation for 11 months. And that was the beginning of really the, the civil rights movement, the contemporary civil rights movement. You never know where you are. That's my point. You only know after the fact. So you keep doing whatever it is that we're doing, we keep doing it because we don't know if what we're doing is the thing that sparks this new moment. What about technology? I think technology is tremendously liberating from the point of view of our ability to reach masses of people. Uh, when we organized the Iraq anti-war movement in the, in before the war even started and got hundreds of thousands of people every month, it was the first time the movement could use the internet to communicate. In the past, you know, we were like printing leaflets or using mimeograph stencils and, you know, doing that run by hand and then taking the, taking the hundred out and distributing. The idea that we can instantly reach masses of people has made a huge difference. And that doesn't mean we can rely on the internet uh, and the bourgeoisie still controls the internet and as, and as we can see, it, it will shut things down but, you know, what happened in Tahrir Square in, in, 2000, in uh, 2011 when the Mubarak government shut down Facebook, everybody who had been following the events in the square from a distance said, oh, now I have to actually go to the square because they shut down the Facebook, shut down Facebook. And so the numbers of people who came to be, participate exponentially grew. So I think it's in our favor generally, even though, you know, it's still under the control of the billionaires. But it, very important. I don't know if that gets to what you're asking. All right, so I'm going to take this hand here and then in the back, Saidi, if you can bring the mic. Hey, so first of all, thank you so much for all these weeks. Um, my question, uh, I w wondered if you wanted to comment on Israel, Palestine, and um, I'm not an expert on Bolshevik history, but my understanding is that when Herzl and the early Zionists uh, proposed Zionism, um, initially the Bolshevik party was very much opposed to it. Um, then during the horrors of uh, World War II, uh, Russia winds up supporting uh, the move okay. of Jews to Palestine. And then, of course, Palestinians uh, are inspired by the common turn. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah, I can d definitely talk about that. Thank you. Thank 
Um, hi, thank you. Um, I have a question about what you were saying about like the rank and file soldiers. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering, this is another question kind of about our, about our like particular context today. Do you think we, in the 21st century under like American, in under the American imperial context still have rank and file soldiers in the same way, like particularly given the hyper militarization and advanced technology in our military and like the way that we fight like wars like as proxy wars through using like soldiers of other nations yeah good question um, really good in terms of Palestine and the Soviet Union and the Comintern the Comintern is uh, born right after the Soviet Union it's dissolved in 19, 1943 so the state of Israel is formed in 1948 uh, the Comintern was formed as an instrument of world revolution that's what it was for why was it dissolved? Because in 1943, uh, the Soviet Union, then under the leadership of Stalin, was in a, in a, a military alliance with British, the British and U.S. government. So the British government, British imperialism, U.S. imperialism, and the Soviet Union were in a military alliance against Nazi Germany and against uh, in, in Russia. The Soviet Union also declared war on Japan in August 1945. I think Stalin's considerations in 1943 were that uh, there wasn't going to be a revolution in the West, that the idea of promoting revolution uh, was only going to be used by British and U.S. imperialism as a reason to break up the alliance. Britain and the United States as imperialist powers uh, they needed the Soviet Union because they needed somebody to fight Germany on the Eastern Front, which the Soviet Union's did. Germany, the Soviets fought 80% of the German divisions. That's why the Soviets lost 27 million people. The U.S. only lost 400,000. Soviets lost 27 million. And they did the bulk of the fighting. They were the ones who defeated German fascism. So it was very convenient militarily for the United States to have an alliance. But Stalin, I think, believed that it was going to be very hard to sustain the, the alliance once the war ended. And clearly the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and then Nagasaki were designed to really start the anti-Soviet Cold War. And that was the breakup, really, of the alliance. <coughs> the U.S. didn't need to drop the atomic bomb. It was signaling Stalin and the Soviet Union, which had just liberated Europe, look, we have a weapon of such magnitude, such destructive capacity, we can kill an entire city with one bomb. And we're using it. We did use it. We showed we're using it. And we're going to use it against civilians. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were entirely civilian cities. They had no military infrastructure at all. They were picked because the U.S. was sending a message not only to Japan, but to the Soviet Union and to the new world order that was going to take the post-World War order. So after... World War II ended, the British government and Britain, co British colonialism had sponsored Zionism in Palestine. It was British colonialism, the Balfour Declaration. But the U.S. was now the new emerging superpower because British imperialism was basically weakened by the outcome of the war. America was the new uh, hegemon, the new leader of the world. The Soviet Union was at, almost immediately at war with Britain and the United States. The U.S. broke up the alliance. And I think the Stalin government felt that because the Soviet Red Army had liberated Eastern and Central Europe from fascism, had liberated the people from the death camps, that it had such goodwill among European Jewry, that if this thing was going to get sponsored anyway by British and American imperialism, by the Soviets co-sponsoring the resolution uh, creating the state of Israel, that Israel would be basically a liberal, social democratic kind of pro-Soviet uh, government because of the Soviet role in eliminating fascism just before. Uh, and that was a big setback for the communist movement in the Middle East that the Soviets did that. It took a long time for the communist movement to gain strength because the Soviet Union was conflated with communism and, and the Soviet government had supported the state of Israel. So I would say 
it was uh, an opportunist move on the part of the Soviet government. Understandable because they were afraid of World War III and they had just lost 27 million people and they wanted peace. They did many other things like not provide arms to the Greek communists at the time that they were fighting for their life against a British dominated regime because they didn't want to provoke imperialism. The Soviet government said to the Italian and French communists who could have seized power after World War II, it was the French and Italian communists who were the resistance. They could have taken the power. But the Soviet calculation in 1945, 46, 47, and 48 was that if there was any revolution in the West or if the Soviet Union looked like it was a belligerent against the US that it would provoke World War III and they were too weak having just lost 27 million people. So they made these decisions which I said they're opportunists but in a way if you're in the Soviet, if you're in the shoes of the Soviet leadership you're like we just lost 27 million people. We can't stand another war. We need a period of peace. Here are these opportunist moves that we're going to make towards imperialism hoping that it you know sort of appeases the beast. And that's what they were doing. Uh, but eventually, the Palestinian left and the Arab left still looked very much to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, in spite of the diplomatic missteps, I would say, provided a lot of support uh, to Arab revolutionary and pan-Arab movements. So uh, it wasn't all one-sided. Um, and then about the rank-and-file soldier. Um, when it was a conscripted army like in Vietnam, it was, we could organize like crazy. You know, I, I think I said, I don't know if I said it, but you know, I was, I was got a draft notice in the, in the beginning. I wanted to go in the army because uh, I wanted to organize against the army because all of these conscripted draftees didn't want to be there. So they were very ripe for anti-war organizing. And I was affiliated with a group called the American Servicemen's Union which had, I don't know, like 20,000 active duty soldiers who were members, uh, many of them in Vietnam. And they were staging rebellions. And they were mainly led by black and Latino soldiers, by the way, who were, the most, who were really the vanguard of the GI movement. That's why the US got rid of the draft. After the Vietnam War, they realized the army could turn against them. The rank and file soldier could become a revolutionary. And big, big anti-war movements in 1970, 71, uh, 72, the biggest contingents and the most militant were GIs who had just come back from Vietnam. They wanted to tear it down. They wanted to burn it down. I mean, the anger uh, about the racism and the imperialism, the mistreatment, and the, just the nature of the war. So all these soldiers became radical. So the U.S. went to a volunteer army to make it harder for radical ideas to seep into the rank and file soldier or sailor or marine. And it is harder, but during the Iraq war, Answer Coalition created a unit, a task force for active duty soldiers, sailors, Marines. And then we organized an independent group that we sustained for a couple of years called March Forward. And it was anti-war, it was Iraq and Afghan anti-war folks who became anti-imperialist. And they, we went into military bases, we organized on the bases, it was, which is way different than organizing somewhere else. Let me tell you. Uh, but, you know, shockingly, surprisingly, a lot of people and a lot of the soldiers' families were all with us. The soldiers were terribly mistreated. They were committing suicide. They came back with terrible life-changing injuries if they came back at all. The government didn't really support them. They were just cannon fodder, and a lot of people were pissed off. So even a volunteer army, you can make inroads. That's why the U.S. uses proxy forces now. The U.S. is using Ukrainians to fight Russia, using Israelis to fight the Palestinians, using other people that wanting to use the Taiwanese to fight China. Because if the U.S. soldiers go, there will be a giant anti-war movement, even with a volunteer army. It will seep into the ranks of the military. And most of those people are, are workers. And they will turn against the war machine. That's why the U.S. uses drones uh, and proxies. So all the bleeding and suffering is somewhere else. Because if the US soldiers and their families are experiencing the bleeding, they will, they will rise up. All right, so I'm gonna, let me see the hands. Okay, let's take here in the back and then here in the front. 
There were two back there, I think. Two back there? Let me see again. The guy with the cap and then the woman right behind him. Okay. So let's do three in this round. Those two and then uh, right here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, great, great sessions and uh, very important ones in my opinion. Uh, I appreciate the uh, focus or emphasis you placed on context for Lenin and how everything he thought and advocated was based on context, or that was my understanding. So for me, what that means is that we need to understand both what he thought and how he thought, and that uh, we need that going forward. In that, uh, so in that vein, uh, in terms of uh, position on the right of nations to self-determination, I'm assuming that that means that uh, contextual thinking means that his position, for example, on the right of Ukraine to form its own independent nation at his time might be different today. And I'd just like you to expand on that or reply to that. <laughs> Thank you. Where is the second hand? Is there a second hand back here? It was, uh, did you have your hand up? No. no? Okay. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm really struck with, I think, you know, what I've sort of gathered from these classes is that Lenin was a tremendous visionary and he was capable of taking the unpopular position um, and taking the position that no one could foresee being the correct one, um, even um, at the risk of like tremendous censure from his own comrades. And I'm you know, wondering how, how does someone develop that sort of leadership? Like how do you actually develop that instinct within yourself to have that sort of vision of being one of the first people to see that communism could move to the South and the East? You know, how do you develop that in your comrades? as well, um, yeah. That's a really tough question. How, what, what makes Lenin, Lenin or Fidel, Fidel or Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg, I mean, I think that history has a tendency at critical moments and at moments of rupture to sort of throw forward the individuals who are compatible with the moment. Someone or some small group of individuals have these extraordinary capacity to be the ones to lead at a particular moment. And you see it throughout history that um, at a given moment there are forces who are there. If you look at the French Revolution, it was Danton and Robespierre and then Babouf and, you know, there, when you go through history, there's, there's these amazing people. And they can't survive without the collective. That's the amazing thing about Lenin. Lenin, Lenin's whole, I, Lenin was the most modest leader ever. Matter of fact, when he got shot, uh, a leftist shot him in 1918 during that period after the Brest-Litovsk Treaty and he was shot in the neck and he almost died and he was kind of unconscious and he he read the newspaper reports about him when he was not conscious and they were like Lenin is a genius Lenin the son of the Russian working class and all of these wonderful superlative statements and he was so disgusted that the party would talk about him as a great figure. He was, and he would never have called himself a Leninist. There was no, Len, Leninism really doesn't, isn't born as a thing until Lenin dies. It's, it's a requirement actually, because Lenin would have never permitted people to call themselves Leninists, except maybe in internal squabbles where he would say the people who were stuck with him, like in that sort of way, but not as a, as, as a new branch of Marxism. So a very modest person, very, I, I mentioned when he fought with people, he was very impersonal. Maxim Gorky, who loved Lenin, also was constantly annoyed with Lenin by his 
the impersonal nature of his outlook. And Churchill talks about this too. Uh, and Churchill wanted to strangle the Bolshevik baby while it was still in the crib, which is why that his formulation about why they sent the British army in right after the revolution. But Lenin, when Lenin fought with people, he had huge fights with these people. He, can, he called them all kinds of names. And as soon as they came over to his position, he was like, yeah, we're comrades. No grudge. There was nothing. There was nothing. He was very impersonal in that sense. He was like the single, all he lived for, breathed for the party and making the revolution. This rare, and that like Lunacharsky, one of the other leaders of the Russian Revolution, talks about that in a book called The Silhouettes about how the sort of biographical about the different leaders that everybody was very obviously committed and dedicated and ready to make the ultimate sacrifice. But Lenin had this kind of single mindedness and purpose. He was the organizer. So he's a theoretician, he's a historian, he's a strategist, he's a tactician. But above all else, Lenin is the organizer. And all of the comrades know that. So people in an organization really respect the organizer, you know, the person who is taking care of everything, you know, making sure that everything is working. And I don't know. I mean, you, you saw it, though, in other places like China with, with Mao and other people. So it's a fascinating topic, the role of the individual in history. Uh, I'm really interested in it. It's contradictory. Anyway, that's my answer. In terms of the other question about Ukraine, I want to talk about Putin, Putin's position on Lenin for a second. Because on February 21st, 2022, three days before Russia moves into Ukraine, the, the Biden administration knew they were going to invade. Because remember, Blinken kept saying, yeah, the Russians are going to invade. Uh, Campbell, all of, the, all of the State Department people said, yeah, Russia's going to invade. But they weren't alarmed about it because they actually wanted Russia to invade. They thought this was going to be sort of the end of Russia. They would sanction Russia because they could have easily negotiated the end of the war before it started. All Russia wanted to do was a promise that Ukraine wouldn't come into NATO, that Ukraine, which is obviously a big part of Russia for centuries and only became independent as a, not independent, but have its own republic in 1922 during the formation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. That's the first time it became a legal entity outside of Russia, but it was still part of the same country because they were part of the Soviet Union. The U.S. could have easily solved that problem. They didn't want to solve it. They wanted to provoke Russia to make the move because then they could unite all of Europe and say, look, NATO is worthwhile. We have an enemy. There's the enemy. How do we know it's the enemy? Uh, Russia violated the UN Charter. They went into, Ru uh, into Ukraine territory. And Putin made the argument like, we're going into an area that has historically been part of Russia for hundreds of years. Kiev was at one time the, the capital of Russia. Uh, that, that, that you are going to turn Ukraine into a NATO military base right on our border and threaten us with missiles that have a, a flight time of five or six minutes and we'll never be able to defend against them and we're not going to let you do it just like you would not let us set up Soviet conventional nuclear missiles at the U.S.-Canadian border or the U.S.-Mexican border that targeted American cities. We're not going to let us, you do it and just like you wouldn't let us do it. So the U.S. knew that this was all coming, right? They, they knew it. The outcome is not what they expected because Russia it hasn't been defeated. The Russian economy uh, and big parts of the global south, the so-called third world, don't want to live under American domination. So they're kind of using this as a space to kind of be independent. But Putin and his explanation of why they were historically justified in going into Ukraine attacks Lenin. He attacked Lenin. I want to read a little bit to you from Putin's speech. It's, not, I, it's a long speech. I'm not going to read the speech. I'm going to read a couple sentences. My address concerns the events in Ukraine. This is three days before the invasion. My address, my address concerns the events in Ukraine and why this is so important for us, for Russia. Of course, my message is also addressed to our compatriots in Ukraine. They had many compatriots in Ukraine. They were all arrested by Zelensky, by the way. 
Zelensky created a police state and the Ukrainian parties and political forces that were wanted to be with Russia are in jail right now or killed. The matter is very serious and needs to be discussed in depth, Putin says. And then he explains. So I will start with the fact that modern Ukraine was entirely created by Russia. Or to be more precise, by the Bolsheviks, by communist Russia. This process started practically right after the 1917 revolution. And Lenin and his associates did it in a way that was extremely harsh on Russia. So Putin is blaming Lenin for being harsh on Russia. By separating, severing what is historically Russian land. Nobody asked the millions of people living there what they thought. Then he talks about World War II. And then he says, I remind you that after the 1917 October Revolution and the subsequent civil war, the Bolsheviks set about creating a new statehood. They had rather serious disagreements among themselves. In 1922, Stalin occupied the position of both the General Secretary of the Russian Communist Party Bolshevik and the People's Commissar for Ethnic Affairs. He suggested building the country on the principles of, this is a hard word, but an important one, autonomization. Stalin was saying we're going to build a new country based on autonomization. That is, giving the republics the future administrative and territorial entities, broad powers upon joining a unified state. So in other words, if Ukraine joined the Russian Socialist Federation, it would have an autonomous republic, meaning there would be some things that Ukrainians could take care of by themselves, but they were still part of Russia. Here's Putin. Lenin criticized the plan and suggested making concession to the nationalists, whom he called independents at the time. Lenin's ideas of what amounted in essence to a confederative state arrangement and a slogan about the right of nations to self-determination up to secession were laid in the foundation of Soviet statehood. Initially, they were confirmed in the Declaration on the Formation of the USSR in 1922 and then in the Soviet Constitution in 24 after Lenin died. This immediate, and I'm going to finish with this paragraph, this immediately raises many questions. The first is, the first is really the main one. Why was it necessary to appease the nationalists to satisfy the ceaselessly growing nationalist aspirations on the outskirts of the former empire? What was the point of transferring to the newly often arbitrarily formed administrative units, that is the Union Republics, those are the 15 republics I mentioned, vast territories that had nothing to do with them? Let me repeat that these territories were transferred along with the population who lived there of what was historically Russia. So Lenin, Putin is blaming Lenin for the creation of, a, of an independent or semi-independent socialist republic of Ukraine. And, Lenin's, and, and Putin's argument is that if Ukraine had always been part of Russia, and did not have the right to secede, meaning the right to become independent, it wouldn't have been independent, and thus NATO couldn't be taking advantage of it. And that this situation is Lenin's fault. That's Putin's position. Now, again, you heard what I said about who we blame for the war in Ukraine. We don't blame Russia principally for the invasion. We blame US imperialism, which deliberately, provocatively, calculatingly, created a situation that was untenable for Russia, and Russia took military action that was essentially a defensive operation to prevent NATO from using NATO as uh, Ukraine as a staging ground. But that said, this is why it's important to be a Leninist, meaning that you can ta take that position against imperialism, but retain your political independence. Who's right? Is Putin right or is Lenin right? And we would say, certainly in the PSL, we would say that Lenin is right. That the, form that the right of oppressed non-Russian nationalities who were indeed not Russian and had been oppressed by the czarist bourgeoisie, the czarist ruling class, by providing people the right of self-determination, the right to get divorced, does not create division, but provides the basis for communist unity meaning the unity based on equality. 
And Lenin is a diehard opponent of great Russian chauvinism. Great Russian chauvinism is, in a way, like white supremacy in America. Think of it that way. Different, of course, not exactly the same. But when this one nation, the great Russian, the old Russian empire, could dominate over all the other non-Russian nationalities, Lenin says, this is the prison house of nations. He's disgusted by it. It's racism. It's the most vile kind of racism. The non-Russian people are treated badly. They're treated with racist caricaturing and stereotyping. And he said, but we can build unity based on workers' unity if we have a socialist republic, meaning everybody has a right to a job, right to affordable housing, right to free education, all these rights, and the right to separate, meaning if, you, if we, the great Russian nation, the bully nation, treat you badly, you can say, okay, we're going to separate from you and we're going to divorce and we'll have our own republic. On the basis of this formula of the right of self-determination, was there a war between Russia and Ukraine between 1922 and 1991? when the Soviet Union, the structure that Lenin created, was there a conflict? Were there wars between Armenians and Azerbaijanis? Were there wars between uh, different parts of Georgia? No. Were there tensions? Of course there would be tensions between different peoples. We're not utopians. We're not looking at the world like there's like some idealistic way. But there was no fighting. If the oil came out of the Caspian Sea in the mostly Muslim Republic of Azerbaijan, it could be shipped to the Christian Orthodox Ukraine basically at cost. So Ukrainian workers benefited, Ukrainian peasants benefited, and so did the Azerbaijanis because they got Ukrainian wheat almost for free. It was an integrated, coordinated, socialist planned economy that brought people together but Lenin's position of the right of self-determination wasn't the genesis of division. It was the genesis of unity. So in the Soviet system, there was the, so the Supreme Soviet and the Soviet of Nationalities. For any law to become a law in the Soviet Union, it had to be adopted by both chambers. That would be like if you had a U the Supreme Soviet, think of that as the U.S. Congress. Say there was another body, a legislative body made up of black, Latino, Asian American, Native, Arab American, meaning people who are uh, oppressed, either oppressed nations within the United States or oppressed national minorities that have been victimized by white supremacy and racism. And for any law to become a law, it would have to be adopted by the Congress and by the Congress of Nationalities. Just think of what that would mean in terms of structure. That would be a profoundly important democratic reform. That's what the Soviet system was that uh, Lenin helped create. That there was, even if it was legal, even if it appeared to be formal, nonetheless, the fact that all of the opp formerly oppressed non-Russian nationalities had, the, had veto power basically over Soviet legislation showed that there was great measures for equality. In 1917, literacy in Uzbekistan was 2%. By 1970, literacy in Uzbekistan, well, college graduates in Uzbekistan outnumbered college graduates in France. Talk about affirmative action. Holt, Lenin's whole policy was affirmative action. He says it in the documents that we circulated about the national and colonial question. He said, in fact, in order to have equality, there has to be some degree of inequality to make up for the centuries of inequality that have been imposed on the oppressed nationalities and opposed, uh, oppressed ethnicities and uh, racial minorities. So for Lenin, this is primary. And the Communist International in, embodied that. That's why China, India, Indonesia, Palestine, Cuba, uh, Ghana, that's why the world became communist, was these principles were a rejection of Eurocentric, Western imperialist, white supremacist orientation that had been so dominant. And this is a hallmark of Lenin. So we understand why the Russians invaded Ukraine, and we think that the United States provoked the war. On the other hand, we don't have to agree with Putin's explanations, which are essentially anti-communist and anti-Leninist, in order to sustain 
a principled anti-imperialist position on the Ukraine. That's how we view Leninism. And the, the qualities you talked about, how to be unpopular, how to be that leader, how to be that party, how to take an unpopular position, that means you, stand, you have the capacity to stand up, take an unpopular position. At the moment, it's unpopular. Maybe it becomes popular later. But also, there are principles that are bedrock principles. Uh, the right of nations of self-determination, the fight against racism, fight against colonialism as being primary and central, not secondary to the class struggle, primary to the class struggle. These are the principles of Leninism. And that's why I think Leninism keeps sort of, even though it goes through sort of periods of retreat, it comes back uh, as the clear wave of contemporary Marxism. Thank you, Brian. Um, we have a lot of also good questions on the chat that we, I don't know that we're going to have time to get to, but I just want to put it out here. Maybe we need to do an, another course on this topic. Um, and next week. And next week will be, please register for the class if you haven't registered already so that you get the link for the virtual Q&A session. There's a lot of questions now about how to understand the relationship of the Chinese Revolution to the uh, Bolshevik Revolution both in history and today. Um, so that might be something that we want to take I, up I later. I had prepared Mao, Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai's comments about the dissolution of the Third International in 1943, but we didn't get to it. So we'll, maybe we'll take that up in the Q&A. So next week we'll have a Q&A session, and I can also throw in some things that I didn't get time for, but that's one of them. Perfect. Very important. So we want to see you here next week. Brian, I don't know if you want to close out with any final thoughts now. No, well, yes, I, I'll just say real quickly, uh, it's been really great to be able to take the time. I, as I said last class, I really, I like adult education a lot more than, hi, um, adult education more than any other, uh, you know, education where people are compelled to go to school. Because we're here because we want to learn. We want to study. And also... The best way to study Lenin and to study Marxism is to study it as part of a collective. What I'm trying to do is provide some basic sort of historical context so that when people keep reading and keep studying together, it's, it's some of the things start to make a little bit more sense because if we had been alive 100 years ago, we would know all these things. You wouldn't need a big class about it. We, it would be contemporary. But we're here 100 years later in a different country. So keep studying Lenin, keep studying socialism, do it as a collective. And again, thank you to the People's Forum and to Saidi in particular for uh, providing all that support. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you, Brian. That's a perfect way to end. Thank you everyone for joining. Again, this is, we study Lenin for rev to make revolution. So we hope to see you back here with your friends, with your comrades studying, letting us know where you're reaching in your studies and your questions and your investigations, and then importantly on how it's affecting the way you participate in struggle. So on that note, I want to just make a couple of announcements. Um, we have volunteer organizer meetings every Monday night. Usually the People's Forum is closed on Mondays, but we're open in the evenings for volunteer meetings for Palestine. Brian talked about it in the beginning of the class. Um, where people are getting together and they're organizing uh, actions to take across the city across the week. Um, so, for example, this week there's, I think, over 20 uh, speakouts or uh, open-air teach-ins that are happening across the city that have been organized at this meeting. There's many other things. We actually can't even keep track of all the different actions that are happening. Um, but it's a really good place to get to meet people, to join up in coalitions in your neighborhoods uh, around shared themes, um, and to keep building the organized character of the struggle, which is what's going to carry us through both the, the good times and the bad. Um, so hope to see you there Monday evenings at 6.30. Um, and then this Saturday, we're all going to be descending on the, uh, the commercial district of Manhattan, uh, the Herald Square. We're going to have a big march where we're going to be focusing our messaging on holding those who have blood on their hands for this genocide happening against the Palestinian people to account which include the political class at a state and federal level and raising up that, uh, the fact that we are not going to accept the tens of thousands of martyrs that have been 
uh, murdered in, in, because of their interests. So join us, we'll be at 2 p.m. at Herald Square. If you wanna help do outreach for this, come talk to me afterwards. Um, and we will see you next week to continue our study of revolutionary theory. There's no revolutionary movement without revolutionary theory, so it's so important that you're all here and participating in this with us. Thanks again, everybody, and we will see you all very soon.